Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. This is your host, Emmett Muckles. This is the day that was made for you to get up, to get it done, and to be thankful. If you don't think you're a billionaire, think about two people in love coming together and they're parting their biological material on each other. One in one, plus the cosmic dance, cause those two things to start to replicate. Due to the power of 30, you were a billionaire before you got onto the planet. So let's start getting to the human being part, which means the experience. Today, my guest is Anne Amagrande. I'm human. And Anne, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. I look right at your name and still got it wrong. <laughs> That's okay. It happens more often than you think. It's yeah. actually the way as a child that we would know when telemarketers were calling. Oh, you get all forms of it. Yep, you can't pronounce it correctly as, as like, anything. I don't know. You click. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. So you got into real estate. Um, you know, real estate is a tricky thing. Everyone makes it sound like it's just, you just do it and everything comes out peachy. If you've ever done it, you know that you're going to lose a few hair follicles You're going to sweat a lot and you're going to be worried until all is said and done. What was your journey into real estate? It actually started at a pretty young age. So when I was in my early teens, we would go with my with my aunts uh, who worked for my grandmother at the time. She was a, a pretty large realtor in Orange County, California. And we would go, we would clean out all of the REOs. So we'd go on the weekends and we wash the windows and we vacuum the carpets. Oh. And clean the, yeah. So we got, we got introduced to it very, very, at a very young age. Um, and, you know, we stopped doing it for many years. So it was kind of ironic that I came back to the space um, many, many years later to kind of follow in her footsteps. So, uh, yeah, so I was actually in the corporate world and I was not necessarily fulfilled, which many people are in there in my job, in my nine to five. Right. So I wanted to do something different. I wanted to, you know, kind of get out there and, and kind of change the world, but I didn't necessarily know how, I, how I was going to do that. So I started flipping a couple of homes on the weekend with a, with a good friend of mine. And, you know, I really happened to enjoy it. And because of my knack for processes and procedures and, you know, creating, creating plans and, you know, sticking to it and sticking to budgets, I was very good at all of those things it made me really, really good within the real estate space because a lot of individuals go in and they're just like, oh yeah, we can totally go in and we can rehab this house. And they don't really have any plans or budgets or timelines. Yeah. And this is how a lot of them get into trouble, which is they go in and they just think that they're going to be able to do it because they watched it on HDTV for a 20 minute episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of things that they don't see. For those of yeah. you who don't know what an REO is, it is real estate owned by bank, a bank. Yeah. So uh, often when people f get foreclosed on or life happens, what, ha what occurs is the bank takes it back, but the bank is not making any revenue off that. So they want to get rid of it as soon as possible, often right. at a discount of the market price. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> I was going to say my, my grandmother, actually, uh, one year of her real estate career, she sold over 300 REOs. Oh my in one goodness. Year. Yeah. What? So I come from a very long line of very powerful women and very, very, very much drivers in our in our industry. You know, we are in we are in the age of Aquarius, which is a very feminine age. And that's mm -hmm. what I was trying to explain to my uncle. He was like, I mean, women are doing things. I'm like, it's their time. It's yeah. literally cosmically their time. All this where we're blowing up stuff is done. <laughs> Now you primarily focus on single family and why is that? Because is it, wouldn't it, I mean, you you probably have enough experience now where you could get into multi-unit of dwellings and probably prosper or, you know, um, instead of flipping, just holding for a while and, and cashing out. Why did you decide to, you know, focus in on the single family? So there's a couple of different reasons. So the first reason is, 
I really want to have a specialty and I really want to create a very good niche that my clients can come to me and our, our investors can come and say, look, this is what we're trying to achieve. And, you know, I don't want to say, well, we've got 48 different options. Which one would you like to go with? Because a confused mind is always going to say no. Yeah. And so what we do is we, we very, very strategic or very strategic and we're very specific as to what we buy and why we buy it. And the reason that we have stuck in the single family, we still diversify a little, but it's not necessarily something we're, we're ready to work with our investors on. We do that internally so that we can work through a lot of the kinks on that side before we present it to our investors. So with our investors, we typically work in the single family. The biggest reason is because of the security and the safety of it. And the reason that there's so much security and safety is because my background is in economics. And what we do is we go through a lot. There's a whole gambit of data that we can collect on not just the real estate market, but the economy as a whole on a city by city. So we know that here in Phoenix, we have X number of companies that are there's a huge influx of tech that's coming into Arizona right now. And it's bringing a lot of jobs, those specific jobs. You know, we've got, um, I think it's in the range of about 7,000 jobs between two different companies that are coming into Phoenix. Wow. Then on top of that, we go back into, okay, well, what kind of what kind of jobs are those creating? What is the income level? What type of homes are they going to be looking for? We also then go back into what are millennials starting to get into, right? So millennials are no longer in that transient phase of, oh, we just want, we watched our parents go through this depression. Right in 2008, they lost their home. We want to be a little more transient. We're like, hey, we don't necessarily want to do that. Now they're starting to transition to getting married, having a family. Now they want the white picket fence, the, you know, all of the things that we all traditionally want as we grow older. So now those millennials are transitioning from living in condos and living in a lot of apartment buildings in those multifamily. They want to start owning a home and they want to build a life for their family and build that generational wealth. And so by doing all of these things, we're actually watching a lot of that economy and we're watching a lot of those things transpire. And so we go out and we are getting a little bit of ahead of the curve where we're going out and we're buying those single families and we're turning them into what we call a lease option or a rent to own. Oh. And so we do rent to own versus just doing a straight rental with the property. So this creates a lot of security and safety for our investors, creates a lot of back end equity that we can we can capitalize on. And we're we really just want to create a win 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 scenario for our investor, for ourselves and our vendors, and then also for our residents. So what's your turnaround time or for going into the contract um, till someone actually owns? Is it a three year, five year, ten year? 15 year or what terms do you give for your people? Because I know you have a, probably a very specific program. There, there is a specific program. A lot of it is dependent on our investor. Okay. So every investor, so we want to, we are very much a boutique firm and we want to create an environment where our, our investors really telling us, Hey, this is what we're looking to do. So our minimum lease option is a five year. And so we will do a five, a seven, a 10 or a 15 year option. And it really depends on what the what the end game is for our investors. So what I do within the company as the CEO, I go out and I work with our individual investors and say, great, let's figure out where, where you want to get to, right? Are you currently working and looking toward retirement? Great. How many years away from retirement are you? Are you currently in retirement and you're trying to utilize the capital that you have to you know, prolong it as long as possible? So we go through a lot of those different questions, very similar to the way that planners typically do. Although I'm not a planner and I want to make that very clear. I'm not a financial advisor and I, I want to make that very clear. But I like to go through those questions with them because I really want to get a personalized feel for what they're specifically looking for. So if you are 15 years away from retirement, I'm not going to put in a 15 year option on every one of those homes. We'd yeah. like to, them to transition once or twice and then we can utilize the capital from the back end of the sale and buy more properties with it. So my goal is to have a transition. So I have, I'll give you a very real world example. I have a doctor I'm working with. Um, he's about 14 years away from retirement. So we did seven year options. So about halfway through all of his properties, we're hoping are going to transition and it'll fluctuate a little bit because not everybody's going to execute. They'll, you know, some people end up moving, you know, things of that nature, but around seven years, most of those properties are going to, are going to expire. And so therefore um, residents are going to start executing on the option. So after seven years, it's exactly like you just said. So um, they're going to start duplicating, right? Okay. So now we take the initial capital and replace the, the property that we just sold. And then the capital that we received on the back end, most of our investors, that, especially in this particular situation, will roll it over and buy another property. So now if you start with 10 after seven years, we're hoping to get you to 20. 
and then at that 14 year so this is kind of i it's what i call our properties making babies so <laughs> you know what if somebody's new to investing you know because it's it's yeah. literally all the rates in in actuality outside of gold it is mm-hmm. one of the only vehicles that have has historically been profitable through time because they've taken away a lot of investments. Our interest rates are extremely low. So CDs, money markets, you can forget about that. You might as well just go loan it to your brother and ask for like a penny back. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) So what would it take for somebody to see what you're doing or hear what you're doing and say, Hey, that sounds like it might be a viable option for me. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how can they begin? It really depends on what they're looking to do. So the first question I always ask everyone is, do you truly want to be active or do you truly want to be passive? And a lot of people believe that they want to be active real estate investors. What they really want is to be able to capitalize on it without other people taking their money. Yeah. Right. And that's what they think when, when they talk to companies like mine, they're like, oh, well, you're just here to take my money. Right. You just want to take you know part of it and you, know, you just want to make money off of my money which, you know, obviously we need to, we need to make profit so that we are, we're there. But a lot of the difference is, is that we actually work on performance. Yeah. So when our clients are working with us, we actually have a hundred percent alignment with our, uh, with our investors, which means that unless I'm making them money, we don't make any money. Right. So if a property is rented and cash flowing every month, I'm working for free. Right. So basically, so, so you're, so you're basically building individuals and investment portfolio. You're right. not a financial advisor. <laughs> Correct. That is very true. <laughs> but this is a, a, what do I call it? This is a new way of thinking. Correct. About real estate because, you know, typically we thought in a very linear fashion and people are very leery of banks and yeah. doing a lot of stuff like that, even mm-hmm. investing in banks. So, you know, I commend you on your ideology of, of what you're putting forth. Thank you. How was it received when you, when you came into this space, how Mm -hmm. did you come up with this scope and says, Hey, here's what we need to do um, for the people and for ourselves. Because one of the things in life is to serve and you're, you're doing that. You're serving um, others to sustain yourself. How how did you come to this premise? Cause you could have just said, Hey, I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to flip a house and then I'm going to do it again and do it again. Or I'm going to do a short sale or I'm going to do, lease options just for myself. What made you say, Hey, I can do this for other people and help them to prosper as well. So I actually, I I think I mentioned, so I was flipping homes originally and I realized that that was not feeding my need to serve others. And I grew up in a very big Italian household and, you know, obviously we're, you know, very matriarchal. And so we, we love to give back and we love to help other people to fulfill their dreams as well. And so I actually sought out education and I found a a fantastic mentor that has been doing what I do for a very long time. And we took exactly what he's been doing all of these years and we kind of made our modifications to it to make it our own. And that's really what it was. So I always encourage people, if you really want to truly be active, you need to find someone that's doing what you want to do and learn from them because it's not about, I mean, none of what I'm doing is, is new. Lease options, lease options have been around for a long time. Buying real estate has been around for a long time. What we're doing is we're actually creating an environment where we are profiting with our investors and that serves us very, very well. And it serves our investors and it serves our residents. So I'm always looking to create that one, one, one scenario for everyone. Do you ever get opposition when you acquire property and the neighborhood knows that it's going to be rented Mm -hmm. versus a home owner, or do they not know because of the quality of the person that you have in the home? It's a little bit of both. So, you know, there have been definitely situations where we we come in and um, obviously we buy a lot of distressed properties, just like just like flippers would be. And sometimes we get people that come up and hug us and they're like, I'm so glad that somebody's going to come in and make this home beautiful because it's, you know, obviously it's just like when you're when you bought your first home. Yeah. Right. What did your parents tell you to buy? Fix your upper yeah. worst house in the yeah. best neighborhood. Yeah, that's, exactly what we do. that's all we're doing. And so we typically get really big hugs. But we also are putting in residents, not tenants. So tenants is a very derogatory word. And 
tenants typically have that have that stigma around them. Oh, well, I have a tenant, right? And when you think of that, you think of some some guy that's you know chopping away with a with a pickaxe on your on your countertops. Yeah. Right. And you're like, how did this? How did the countertops get this bad? Because you just have this mental image of somebody with a with a butcher knife just hacking away, and you're like, use a cutting board. I mean, all of those different things. But when we put individuals into our homes, we are actually helping them to become homeowners. They have a very different psychology than just a tenant who's going to look at it like just a, a place that you're, they're going to live, a roof over their head for the next year until they move to the new place, Yeah. right? When we move our residents in, they actually intend to buy the home. That's their intent of moving in. And we like individuals that have that psychology because when you consider the home your own, you're going to take care of it. That's and you absolutely want true. Yeah. And so we put individuals into homes that truly want to transition and truly want to become homeowners. And we help them bridge the gap between renting and owning. So why don't people just do this themselves? I mean, like what you're doing is anyone can do it. Absolutely. So why don't people do it? Is it, I'll let you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a couple of different reasons. So, um, a few years back, Dodd-Frank was enacted and Dodd-Frank basically changed the way that we can do lease options. So there are a lot of, a lot of individuals that did lease options. They didn't want to, you know, get, get a lot of the attorneys to come in and, and change the way that their documents were handled because a lot of things changed. So we actually partnered with quite a few people and we, you know, had some attorneys get together and, you know, we made sure that our documents were sound because we wanted to continue to provide this opportunity for our residents, provide a great opportunity for our investors as well. And so it, it does take a lot of extra time. Um, it's, it's a lot of training. There's a lot, there's a really a lot of work that goes into it. Yeah. Just like, just like if you have a tenant and you're getting those phone calls in the middle of the night, we still get those calls, yeah. but we just handle them differently. And we're actually running this like a business versus a hobby. And because we have such a, a large portfolio in each one of the cities that we're in, it allows us to have that economies of scale. So we are able to keep our costs extremely low for our investors. So you might want to do two or three properties with us. And then Mr. Jones might want to do five or six properties with us. Well, if we work on that all together, we can actually, it's just like a management company, right? So we can actually go out and we can demand lower costs because we have the volume to, to demand that. But if you're just replacing one AC a year versus 15, yeah. then you know, you're know you going to be paying more closer to retail, but we can actually demand lower, lower costs. So that's a, that's a good way that we, we save our investors quite a bit of, quite a bit of costs on their, on their portfolios. Did you set up a property management, which means material management for your properties in the various states, or do you do that a la carte or is, what's the management on that? And the reason I'm asking, is I'm literally just curious because if you have this yeah. many homes, yep. st- I'm a homeowner. Stuff yep. happens. <laughs> Stuff does happen. You're absolutely correct. So our headquarters is based in, in Phoenix, but each city we go into, we actually have a minimum number of properties that we're going to be buying in that city because of the, you know, there's obviously an economy of scales, right? So yep. there is a cost that's associated with setting up in a new market. So we typically need to buy somewhere between 20 and 50 homes yep. in each city that we move into because that's going to cover the cost of our, because we actually hire an individual. We're not going to a property management company typically, but we will hire an individual and then we will make quarterly visits. We, there's a lot of structure that I put into place to make sure that we are able to manage because again, goes back to my backgrounds, right? Yeah. So my background is in ops. My background is in logistics. I want to make sure that we're hundred percent set up in any set that we go into and that we're going to be buying an appropriate number of properties to make sure that we're hitting our profit margins for our investors. We're hitting our profit margin and our revenue number for ourselves so that we can maintain maintain cost control. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. <laughs> now, do you teach this to other people? I, I not on an official <laughs> level. Um, I, I, I that's, that's fine. You said it. No, I mean, what I was going to say is I, I love to help mentor people. And if they have questions, I I'm all of, I have a lot of people that come to me and ask me questions like, Hey, yeah. does this ever happen to you? Um, I don't do it not on an official scale because I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of a self-confidence thing almost, you know, I, I know that there are a lot of people that I could help, but I also know that there's more people out there that know more than I could. I'm like, why would you want to ask me? I, <laughs> I know that sounds funny. Girl, after this, me and you going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. No, um, you know, that's really empowering, empowering. And it's also a good look just because, um, 
what we knew died. I say in 1995, the mm-hmm. industrial complex got sick. In 2000, 2001, it kicked the bucket because we don't manufacture almost nothing. I mean, there's nothing really that you can say is literally made in America except for those car mats. (laughs) And I'm just being being honest. And we've become a service economy and basically a barter and trade economy, which is what you're doing. And I'm always, you know, referring to people in conversation and saying, you have to close your eyes and open them up and look at the world anew because what we once were is not the staple anymore. And you, yes. and especially if you're a millennial, millennials kind of get it. People on the edge of millennium, they're still thinking we're an industrial age. So like I said, I commend you for, for doing what you do and leading the way. And it also gives people insight into where the world is now. Mm-hmm. Now, I want you to do this for me. Yes. You have to close your eyes. Okay. So we're going to go back probably about five years ago when you were like 17, 18. (laughs) Nice try. I'm good like that. (laughs) And you're sitting on the couch as you are right now. You're sitting on the couch right now, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have any deals to do. You don't have any, the phone's not ringing. You got a nice thing in Moscato. You probably bought to watch Scandal. You're just chilling. At 17, I should be having Moscato. No, no, no. This is, this is, uh, no, stop. This is the you (laughs) now I'm talking about. The one I'm looking at. You're you're on the couch with the Moscato. I kind of set this up. Then all of a sudden the doorbell rings and you're like, God, I got to put my Moscato down and turn the TV off. And you get up and go to the door. And there is the 17 year old you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like five, seven years difference. (laughs) And the 17 year old you looks at you and goes, mm, not bad. Looking good and good. So, you know, I, I've got a journey ahead of me. What do, what advice can you give me to make sure I get there where you are with a little less pain? I'd probably say that's a hard one because every every experience that I have had has led me to exactly where I am now. And I'm grateful for every, every pain point that has happened. If I was going to say less pain, I'd probably say to spend more time with my family and as much time as I spend with them, that is, that's truly what this is all about. It's not about the amount of money that I'm going to make. It's not about the lives that I will change. It's about my family. That's and awesome. that's what it should be for everybody. Um, but I would not change any experience that I've had because it has helped me to become the woman that I am. It has helped me to become as strong as I am. And it helps me to help others to prevent them from hitting the pitfalls that I've had. And I'd rather go through those pitfalls than have other people in my life go through them. You know, the be- the power was in your paws. That was awesome. <laughs> The power was in the pause because that really came from your whole being. Would, do you have any words? No, 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 no. Let's backtrack. I got one more. <laughs> Go for it. I'm all about it. So there's this guy walking into the building with you. You know, nice tall ball head guy. He's probably got a Michigan hat on and a nice <laughs> suit. And both of you are ahead and you just look at him. You're like, Hey, what's up? And he's like, Hey, what's up? And you keep going about your business and you end up on the elevator together, going up to the 38th floor. And he looks over at you and says, what do you do? He's asking you for your elevator speech. Mm-hmm. What's your speech? My name is Ann. I am a private equity investor. What is it that you do? I look at your Manolo Blonix. Awesome. No, I'm kidding. This is, here's the thing. This is, and this is what, this is not about me. And that's, that's really what that elevator speech is about. And, this and, is not about me. and that's what I was trying to pull out. That's awesome. Because here's, what's really cool about it. Everything you said throughout this entire interview and people, I really want you guys to understand this because she's the embodiment embodiment of it for us to really prosper on this planet we have to serve one another. If you go back 
several hundred years before we got all this stuff that we have. We were these little bitty communities, probably 25 to maybe a couple hundred people. And we had to serve each other. We were living in a utopia because everybody had purpose. Everybody had community and everybody had love. Everybody had something to do and it didn't involve money. What it involved was you being a part of. That means serving someone else to serve yourself to serve someone else. And throughout this entire interview and as re enforce this to the hill. Not only is she giving to another family so that they can have an opportunity, but then they'll have even more opportunities for other people to help those people get it done. This is the billionaire lifestyle. Everyone always asks me, hey, I'm not a billionaire, in which I go into the 30 day or I talk about the hand and how just your hand has a billion cells. We are human beings. H-U-E, people under the sun, because we all have a color because we're not translucent. We are in the image of man. The issues we have is the being part. Sometimes we get caught up in other people's beings. You know, they say this thing. What's one of the first rules in running a race? Stay in your lane. So, stay in your lane but make sure that the person in the lane next to you can stay in theirs, help them along. I want to thank you so much for being on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast, Anne. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how it ends. I usually end with that, but it's just what it is. We are human beings. There is one race and we're all in it. So figure out your lane. Make sure your brother can stay in his or her lane. And we will all win. Till next time, love you all. Peace.